Okay, good, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And now we are uh, now to the second uh, keynote lecture. Uh, we have uh, uh, the pleasure to have uh, here uh, Professor Robert Pindijk uh, from MIT. I'm extremely glad to think about the beginning of our journey together on the 1st of December with the first economic modeling seminar of the series Welfare Cost of Catastrophes, Lost Consumption and Lost Lives by Professor Pindijk. With this keynote lecture of the uh, IAR conference, uh, and our path is taking us to a point where everything began. And so it's a pleasure for me to have here uh, Robert. So now, uh, before uh, uh, introducing uh, um, Robert Prindijk and uh, a little bit uh, to explain uh, his uh, curriculum bit, I leave the floor uh, to uh, Professor uh, Christian Gollier, who now, now he's here, uh, because uh, uh, you know, uh, yesterday, I started to speak about uh, uh, the idea of this community. Now, this is uh, a word of our conference. As I told you yesterday, the idea is uh, to uh, bring together to, to, uh, to speak about exactly this uh, uh, new journey, short journey in this hour, uh, three days uh, about the idea of community. Community is actually a research, a research on uh, our association, but also other, other association and also collaboration in order to uh, reach our goals and to increase our research. So now I leave the floor to Christiane. I thank you very much, Christiane, to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, yes, and congratulations for uh, this very impressive uh, event organized by the Italian Association. Um, it, it, clearly, your association was of the strongest uh, country association of uh, in Europe and, um, and with um, not only uh, in terms of size, in terms of quality, also in terms of leadership, uh, that's that's quite impressive. I think you are uh, Italian association is a benchmark for many other countries. Uh, let me say a few words about the European Association. So it's a, it's a very lively association too. It has uh, 1,300 members uh, approximately. It was created uh, 31 years ago. So we are older. Um, it's home and meeting place for uh, for the best environmental and resource economists, both young and, and old. So it's a very lively community. And as you know, uh, I mean, environmental economics is now at the center of uh, many social and political issues. Uh, and and this association, I mean, uh, I'm sure the Italian association has the same has the same position. The European association has no official position on those policy on, on those policy issues, but it promotes uh, internal de internal debates uh, for policy shaping uh, and offers the possibility for its member to uh, to take a stand on them. Uh, so, for example, the European association uh, published. It was uh, 15 months ago, 16 months ago, uh, a statement of uh, for carbon pricing. It has now uh, 1,700 uh, signatures. Uh, and let me just uh, make, uh, I mean, read the first articles of that statement, um, hoping that you will you will agree on this. And, and probably, I mean, for those who didn't sign it yet, uh, maybe you can go to the to the to the website of the association to to uh, to sign it. So so this is the article. Um, a price of carbon offers the most cost effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. By correcting a well known market failure, a carbon price sends a powerful signal steering economic actors towards a low carbon future. It encourages technological innovation, large scale infrastructure development, as well as the diffusion of carbon efficient goods and services. So it's, a, it's, it's good to remind uh, this statement, in particular this day, uh, given what happened in, in, Was in Washington today, uh, also mentioning the Biden $2 trillion um, uh, infrastructure plan uh, and the EU Green Deal that is currently under discussion in Brussels. And uh, I think in both cases, uh, economists are ur urgently needed to uh, uh, to uh, to push uh, ideas that you know uh, climate change will be costly, and we need to minimize the associated cost uh, for a given uh, uh, temperature target. And so, 
yeah, uh, the European Association together with the country association uh, should, uh, should do more uh, as a community of uh, providing scientific knowledge to the policy makers. Uh, and I think we, uh, our, our, our two association has been quite, um, quite useful in that domain. We are still uh, building a stronger, uh, a stronger action uh, toward that. In particular, the European Association has created three years ago uh, a policy outreach committee. Uh, maybe some of you, uh, Simone, is in the audience. Uh, it's something extremely important. So let me stop here because I'm sure you are not you are not here to hear me, but rather to hear uh, uh, Bob Pindyke's uh, uh, enlightening uh, paper for uh, for uh, climate climate change and, and catastrophic risk. Thank you very much, Christian. It's an honor to be <laughs> that you are here. Uh, Professor uh, Christian Goulier, that is the president of the European Association and founder of the executive director of the Toulouse School of Economics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, now uh, from here, from the uh, library room of uh, the Department of Economics at the University of Brescia, I continue and I introduce uh, um, Professor Pindag after I leave the floor to him. Uh, Okay, Professor Pindek will present uh, this uh, uh, the paper that is uh, titled, to, so the, his, his keynote lecture is uh, Climate and Other Catastrophes. I remember that uh, he is uh, uh, in our um, association with uh, this, that is exactly our, all the, our group that uh, are, uh, thanks to them that we are here to uh, have this uh, um, conference. Professor Pindaik uh, is a uh, uh, Bank of Tokyo uh, Mitsubishi Professor in Finance and Economics, Professor of Applied Economics at the uh, MIT School of Management, uh, School of Management. Research topics is uh, uh, about the economics of catastrophes, environmental economics and the public policy and energy and commodity markets, macroeconomics regulation and antitrust, natural resources, resource markets, investment under uncertainty. About uh, his research, I remember a, a lot of uh, papers. So there is a huge uh, CV, a very, very long CV with a, a, a long list of papers. I remember all only the most important, but it's all are very, very important about uh, the top journal that are American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Journal of Economic Literature, Review of Economics and Statistics, uh, Journal of Economics, Dynamics Control, Energy Economics, and its journal, uh, Jim and the others, but so you, you can see that the list is very, very, very long. Uh, books, uh, there are also very important books for us uh, about uh, econometrics, models, and economic forecasts. Uh, there is a textbook that is microeconomics, uh, which is used a lot also in Italy, but, uh, the, the, the edition in Italian language is also used a lot in, in Italy. And also investment under uncertainty, which is very, very important also for me because I, I worked uh, in my PhD <laughs> exactly on this book. This is uh, one of the most important book on uh, um, research about uh, investment under uncertainty, the role of uncertainty. And also uncertainty is inside uh, uh, the presentation of today, but uh, uh, on another point of view that is related to catastrophes. Uh, uh, Professor Pindex also, uh, according to the international ranking of the most influential authors, uh, is, uh, he, uh, he ranks among the top, uh, in, especially in these three fields, that is environmental economics, energy economics, and resource economics. Uh, concluding the results for owners and awards and consultative, which is very, uh, also in this case, is very long. I, I have chosen, I collect all, also the most important according to my idea, but it's, it's very, very long. Selling uh, his teaching award, MIT Sloan School in 2002, but others, uh, it's one of uh, all star paper award, uh, Journal for Financial Economics, uh, uh, Jamison Prize for, uh, for Excellence in Teaching 2018. About consulting, there are public and, uh, and private and public uh, consulting about Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors, uh, uh, the World Bank, uh, UN, uh, US, sorry, Department of Energy, Verizon Communications, uh, Detronic, uh, Alex Moco, uh, Compang, and many, many others. Okay, so this loss, uh, the list is very long. Now, I, I, me too, I don't want to waste, uh, to use more of your time because the floor is totally of uh, our keynote lecture. It's an honor, a pleasure, and I'm very glad to leave the floor now to uh, Professor Pindyk uh, with uh, the keynote lecture, Climate and Other Catastrophe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergio. That was very, very kind of you, that introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give this, to give this uh, lecture. I'm, I'm uh, 
looking forward to doing it. I've put up on the screen, I hope everybody can see this, a PowerPoint. Um, I looked out my window this morning. I needed a nice picture to start the talk. So I looked out my window and, and this is what I saw. <laughs> so I took a picture and put it in the PowerPoint. I'm sitting in the lower right-hand corner and hopefully I, the wave won't wash me away before I finish this talk. We'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, here's what I wanna do. So here's an overview. Um, I wanna begin by just summarizing some of the things that we know and we don't know about climate change. Um, what is it that we don't know about climate change? And why don't we know those things? And that brings us to this question of the social cost of carbon. What, what is that in terms of, you know, what is the number for it? It's an important concept because it's the basis for a carbon tax. And then I'll talk, let me see if I can get this to work. Then I'll talk about catastrophic climate outcomes because that's really what matters. Uh, you know, the most likely outcomes, if you look at sort of what is the, the middle of the road, most likely outcome, it's not so bad. And it, it makes it hard to justify uh, taking rapid and extreme action. Catastrophic outcome, on the other hand, can change all of that. So what is the likelihood of a catastrophic outcome and how catastrophic might it be? And then we'll talk about the likelihood and how to assess it. I'll, I'll explain why integrated assessment models, IMs, are not very useful for this. Um, perhaps expert elicitation can be used. I'll show you some results. Uh, but then I'm gonna tell you that other catastrophes are possible as well. You've heard of COVID, well, pandemics, other things, nuclear terrorism. What do we make of all of this? Once we're in the world of catastrophes, um, can we look at them one by one, uh, you know, handle one, look at the next one, the next one, and the answer is no, they're actually not independent, and I'll try to explain why. So that's the overview of what I want to talk about. All right, let me begin with what we know and don't know. Here's what we know. We know that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is increasing. And we know that it will eventually cause warming, uh, perhaps higher sea levels, and perhaps uh, stronger hurricanes. And um, these things are on net bad things. They'll reduce GDP, uh, broadly defined, uh, reduce social welfare. They're bad things on net. And therefore, it implies that there's a social cost of carbon, an externality. The full cost of burning a ton of carbon is greater than the private cost. And the social cost of carbon, the SEC, is the basis of a carbon tax or equivalent policy to reduce emissions. That we know, okay? Here's what we don't know. How large is the social cost of carbon? Estimates range from $15 a ton to well over $200, $300, $400 a ton a huge, huge range. That means we don't know what the number is. Now you might say, can't we use a model, an integrated assessment model to estimate the social cost of carbon? Many, many models have been built. This is a growth industry uh, building these models. And uh, the, un but unfortunately, they're really not useful for this. They're, they're limited in ways, and I'll explain how, that they just cannot give us a number for the social cost of carbon. What matters in the end is the possibility of a catastrophic outcome. And the models can't tell us much about that. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that. A little bit on the models. First of all, here's how it works. The way you would use one of these models to look at the social cost of carbon is you'd project future emissions of carbon dioxide under business as usual, and one or more abatement scenarios. Now there's uncertainty here, uh, you know, how much carbon dioxide will still be emitted even with an abatement scenario, uh, but it's plausible. You can do this and there's uncertainty, but it's plausible, not bad. Then given a trajectory for emissions over the next 100 or whatever years, 
we do a projection of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. Again, there's uncertainty here, but this is plausible. This is reasonable. Next, we take the trajectory for the carbon dioxide concentration and use that to project the temperature increase. Now that's called climate sensitivity. How will a change in the concentration of carbon dioxide affect temperature? We, we call that carbon, uh, climate sensitivity. Here, the uncertainty is huge, huge. And the reason is that there are critical feedback loops that we just don't know much about. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about that in a moment. But that makes it very, very difficult to project the temperature increase. Let's suppose we can project the temperature increase. You know, you figured out how to do it. What matters is what does it do to, eco to uh, GDP broadly defined? We want to take GDP as measured, but we want to include mortality, morbidity, health effects, uh, migration, other things. That's what matters. You know, if the temperature went up and it didn't hurt us, it didn't do anything, who cares? Why should we worry about it? We worry about it because we're afraid that a higher temperature will do bad things, will result in bad things. What kind of bad things? What will be the impact? We don't know. We know close to nothing. There's no theory, no economic theory, no theory in physics. There's no empirical work. There's no data. There's almost nothing. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a moment. That's a big problem. We just don't know much. But suppose we could project the change in GDP. Then what we would want to do is determine the present value of those losses of GDP. Now, the problem here is that because these losses happen over the next 100 years, the discount rate is critical. It's just critical. If the discount rate is very low, if it's only 1%, then we got a big problem. Then those losses, the present value of those losses is huge. If the discount rate is more like 5%, those losses don't matter much. The problem is that economists don't agree on what's the correct discount rate. We'll say a bit about more, more about that later, but that's a big issue. We don't agree on what's the right discount rate. Different people have different views on this. The result of all this is the very, very wide range of estimates of the social cost of carbon. That's the problem, okay? Now, the models, you know, I've written about this and, and maybe I've taken too strong a position, but my basic issue with the models is that they create a perception of knowledge and precision that's misleading. It's just not there. You know, people think if it's a model, a computer model, it must be scientifically valid. And so the models create this impression that's misleading. That's my main concern with them. All right, um, let's go to climate sensitivity. And why don't we know climate sensitivity? Why is there so much uncertainty? Now remember the definition. Climate sensitivity is a number and it tells us the temperature increase that will eventually result from a doubling of the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. So if today we suddenly doubled the atmospheric CO2 concentration, it's about 400 parts per million. If we suddenly today made it 800 parts per million, how much will the temperature go up? That's called climate sensitivity. Eventually, however, means after the system, the climate system reaches a new equilibrium. That doesn't happen overnight. That can take 20, 30, 50 years. In fact, it actually, for the full, uh, to reach full equilibrium can take 100 or 200 years, but you're most of the way there after 40 or 50 years. All right, so that's what we're looking at. That's climate sensitivity. And the problem is that climate sensitivity depends on crucial feedback loops. For example, it gets warmer, that affects the oceans, that affects the carbon dioxide in the oceans, and so on. 
And these loops, the feedback parameters, we don't even know the signs of some of them and we don't know the magnitudes. That's the difficulty. And let me illustrate it uh, in a way that I, this should be fairly simple. S sub zero is climate sensitivity if we didn't have any feedback effects. And I'm going to take all the feedback loops and lump them into one number, F. F is the feedback factor. It's less than one. And so actual climate sensitivity is S sub zero divided by one minus F, all right? And if F is close to one, which it is, then we got a problem because any uncertainty over F magnifies uncertainty over climate sensitivity. So for example, suppose the best estimate of F is, is 0.95, but we're not sure it's 0.95. The range is 0.92 to 0.98, plus or minus 0.03, all right? It's a small range. What does that do? Well, that says the climate sensitivity could range from 12.5, times S zero to 50 times S zero, a factor of four. So a small amount of uncertainty over the feedback loop creates a large amount of uncertainty over S, all right? So that's the issue. And uh, let me see if I can fix this now, I'm having a problem here. Okay, so that's the problem we've got. And what have we learned? You know, climate science, has taught us quite a bit. It's shown us that we know even less about the feedback effects and thus climate sensitivity than we originally thought. So that's what's going on here. We just don't know the value of climate sensitivity. By the way, the IPCC, these numbers keep changing, but the IPCC puts a range, a most likely range for climate sensitivity of something between 1.5 and 4.5, that's a huge range. That's a factor of three. That's the most likely range. If you include a range that's, if you include numbers that are less likely but possible, the range is 1.0 to 6.0. So a large, large range. It's just a lot of uncertainty. Okay. Let me turn now to the damage function. Let's suppose that somehow somebody could tell us the actual value of climate sensitivity, and then we could project temperature. Suppose we know what the temperature increase T is uh, over the next 100 years. What does it do to GDP? Well, typically what we do, or what the models do, is they introduce a loss function or damage function, L of T. If T is zero, L of, L of zero is one. And if you make T bigger, L gets smaller. GDP is equal to the loss function times GDP star, which is the GDP with no warming, if there were no temperature increase. So the loss function tells you how much GDP is lowered as a result of a higher temperature, okay? So for example, the uh, Bill Nordhaus's DICE model uses an inverse quadratic loss function. So what it looks like, one over one plus alpha T plus beta T squared, okay? Now the problem is that this loss function is an arbitrary function. It isn't derived from some kind of theory or based on some kind of empirical work. It's just essentially made up to show that GDP goes down as T goes up. That's it. It's ad hoc. It's arbitrary. And by the way, the other integrated assessment models have different loss functions that are also made up. What about the parameters, alpha and beta? Where do you get those from? Do you estimate them from my, by running a regression? No, you can't. There's no data. They're chosen so that the loss function for say two degrees warming or four degrees is consistent with what we might call the common wisdom whatever that means if if there's a one degree increase in temperature no problem that won't do anything 
two degrees, well, then L is 0.99 or 0.98, you know, a one or two percent loss of GDP. Four degrees, maybe it's 0.96, four, a four percent loss of GDP. Is that correct? Is that right? Who knows? It could be totally wrong. We don't know. We don't know what would happen if there were four degrees of warming. We don't know what it would do to GDP. We have no experience with two degrees, with four degrees, or six degrees, all right? We just don't know. And why is it that we don't know? The problem is that um, warming occurs slowly, and that means there can be adaptation. How much adaptation will happen? We don't know. We know there can be adaptation, but we don't know how much. And the result is that we're in a world of guesswork. We just don't know what will happen. Now, I wanna say a little bit about adaptation. Some people are skeptical and they say adaptation. Well, we know there'll be adaptation. What we would like to do is run an experiment. Here's the experiment, and I'm going to do this in the context of agriculture. And agriculture in the United States, in North America, although it could be anywhere. We'd like to run an experiment. Here's what we want to do. We're going to change the climate. Increase the temperature by three or four degrees, whatever. Change the climate, okay? See what happens to GDP. Write down what happens. And then, of course, if we don't like what happens, we'll come back to where it was before. We'll undo the experiment, okay? We cannot run that experiment. That can't be done. But it turns out that experiment was run for us historically. Let me show you what happened. You know, uh, the, you're all, most of you are in Europe right now and um, very far away from the United States. But remember, Europeans came to the United States, mostly from the UK. I guess that's not Europe anymore, right? Uh, they came to the United States and they settled on the eastern part, the eastern seaboard. All right. Around Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Virginia and so on. That's where they settled. And when they settled, they started planting crops. And, uh, and among those crops were grains, wheat, for example, also corn was planted. Now, uh, in let's say around 1850, most of the wheat that was grown in the United States was grown in the eastern part of the United States, Pennsylvania, parts of New York State, a little bit into Ohio. That's where the wheat was grown. Now, what happened? Well, people started going to the West. They migrated to the West. And in the West, there was a lot of land. And so many people moved to the West. And what did they find when they went to the West? Rich, dark soil without rocks. You know, if you come to the Boston area of Massachusetts, uh, and you start digging in the ground, what's going to happen? You're going to have rocks. It's very hard to plant, very hard to till the soil because it's so rocky. If you go out to Kansas, Nebraska, and dig holes in the ground, it's easy. There's no rocks. The soil is rich, wonderful. So people moved west and they planted grains, wheat, for example, corn. What happened? It didn't grow. It was a failure, wouldn't grow. Why is that? Because of climate change, not climate change over time, climate change over regions, because the climate in the Midwest, the climate in Illinois, Missouri, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, was very different than the climate in New England, for example, or Pennsylvania. How was it different? Summers were much hotter, and the winters were much colder, and rainfall was much more irregular. There would be long periods of drought. So what happened? The wheat didn't grow, and the result, no good, a problem. So look what we had. 
In the 1850s, we had a big problem. People, for people who moved west, they couldn't grow these crops. What did they do? They adapted. How did they adapt? What they did is they brought in, these are called cultivars, new, different strains of wheat, different strains of wheat that they brought from places like the Ukraine. Because the Ukraine had these extreme climates, extreme temperatures, both very hot summers, very cold winters. So they brought in these cultivars of wheat, they planted them, they tested them, and they grew beautifully. They also created new cultivars, hybrid strains of grains of wheat and corn by experimenting. So what happened was that by 1930, 1920, most of the wheat in the United States was no longer grown in Pennsylvania and New York State uh, and Ohio. Most of it was grown in the Midwest because of adaptation. So that's an example of an experiment that was run for us to show what happens if you have climate change. And here, the, again, the change is not over time, it's over regions, over places in the United States, all right? That's adaptation, that's just an example. By the way, um, uh, this, uh, there's a book by uh, Alan Olmsted and Paul Rode. It's uh, a book on agriculture and technological change in agriculture. It's really fascinating. It goes through a lot of what happened. All right. Another example of adaptation is uh, Hurricane Sandy. This, this, this was a hurricane that flooded southern Manhattan. Some of you may remember this. What do you do? Because it's going to happen again. It can happen if there's rising sea levels. It can happen if there are stronger, more powerful hurricanes that result from higher temperatures. Well, the plan is you build sea walls, this green uh, wall around southern Manhattan. And that's the plan. We don't have this yet. Uh, but there's a plan to do this, all right? And, you know, um, in Venice, you, you know that there are, uh, there's been construction of seawalls, of ways of preventing flooding. So we adapt. These are examples of adaptation. Some more examples. More efficient heating and cooling systems. Flood-resistant construction technologies. I mentioned seawalls and flood wall technologies. Agriculture, hybrid grains, more efficient drip irrigation to deal with problems of drought. Geoengineering, this is a word that, boy, environmentalists don't like this, uh, but it's something we may have to think about and work on, in which we put sulfur particles in the atmosphere, and that reduces, doesn't get rid of the carbon dioxide, it reduces the greenhouse effect. We may have to change the regulatory environment because if we have predictable coastal flooding, well, then we can do things from a regulatory point of view to prevent damage. We can prevent construction in some areas. In the United States today, and in Europe, by the way, we subsidize building in vulnerable areas by providing insurance at rates that are way below their actuarial values. So we subsidize construction. We have to remove those subsidies, discourage this kind of building. So that's an example of adaptation. Now, is adaptation going to eliminate the problem? No, probably not. How much will it help us? We don't know. It's one of the reasons why there's so much uncertainty over the impact of climate change, because we don't know how much adaptation will occur and the extent to which it will help us. All right. Now, I said before that what matters is a catastrophic outcome. If the discount rate is 2% or more, then the most likely scenarios that come out of the IPCC, that come out of many studies, give you a rather small social cost of carbon. For example, the US Interagency Working Group that was set up and 
used three different integrated assessment models to estimate the social cost of carbon. They came up with a value of $40 a ton using a 3% discount rate. By the way, you, by the way, you may wonder where did the 3% discount rate come from? I mean, this political group, this interagency working group came up with 3%. Is that the right discount rate? Did they conclude that the correct discount rate is 3%? They tried 1%, they tried 4%, 5%. There was no agreement among the members of that group what the correct rate is. Everybody wanted to go home. It's getting late. They wanted to go home, so they said, let's use 3%. It's in the middle of the range, and then we can go home. So that's the number they used. Not because they decided that 3% is the correct discount rate. It's because that's in the middle of the range. So anyway, using 3% and averaging across these models, they got a $40 social cost of carbon. That's equivalent to a gasoline tax of about 40 cents a gallon uh, in the United States, uh, what is that, about 10 cents a liter, um, about 10, a tenth of a euro, 10, cent, 10 uh, cents of a euro on a liter, very, very small number, and that's a very small number. But again, it's based on most likely scenarios. What if the outcome is not most likely, but catastrophic? Now, what do we mean by catastrophic? We mean economic impact, not necessarily a big temperature increase. You could have a moderate temperature increase that has a huge economic impact, causes a 20% or 40% drop in GDP. That would be catastrophic, right? That's what matters is the impact. Then you get a much higher social cost of carbon. Now, of course, it depends on how likely this catastrophic impact is. 5% chance of happening, 10% chance. Well, uh, we don't know, but that's really what affects a catastrophic outcome and what affects the social cost of carbon. The models cannot tell us anything about this. There's nothing that we know. They don't know anything. There's nothing in the models. There's no physics. There's no climate science. There's no economics. There's no theory. There's no data that can tell us what this is. So the models are of no use. What do we do? How can we estimate the social cost of carbon? One approach is to use rough subjective estimates. This, this is not great, but it may be the best that we can do. This is what was done many years ago when assessing the world's greatest, greatest catastrophic risk during the Cold War, the possibility of a U.S.-Soviet nuclear exchange. How likely was that? What would happen? No data, no models, no theory, no empirics. What do you do? You do analysis based on the plausible, what might happen. You think about what might happen. What were the probabilities? What could happen? What's plausible? And that's how this potential catastrophe was analyzed back during the Cold War. We may have to use the same approach to assess climate catastrophe. Consider a range of catastrophic outcomes and probabilities, a range that's acceptable to a range of economists and climate scientists. And given plausible outcomes and probabilities, and I stress the word plausible. Plausible means people don't laugh when you say it. They say, yeah, that could happen. Yeah, that's reasonable. Calculate the present value of benefits from averting that outcome or reducing the probabilities of their occurrence. Now, I said present value, that means discount rate. You need a discount rate and you have to get some kind of consensus, again, on a plausible discount rate. Maybe it is something in the middle of the range, but you'll need that as well. This is a tough problem. I decided to try to look at this from the point of view of expert elicitation, a survey. So I surveyed economists and climate scientists who were experts. Now, what do I mean by experts? 
they've published highly cited papers in this area. And the object of analysis was the economic impact of climate change measured by the reduction in GDP broadly defined. I didn't care how that reduction happened. I didn't care how climate change would cause a drop in GDP. All I cared about was the outcome. What did these experts think about the possibility of a catastrophic outcome? What were the probabilities of a catastrophic outcome? And by how much would you have to reduce emissions growth to avert these extreme outcomes? In other words, to truncate the impact distribution. With that information, I could compute an average social cost of carbon. The total benefit from truncating the distribution, the impact distribution, divided by the total emission reduction. Now, you know, normally we think of a social cost of carbon, back up, it's, it's a marginal measure. The way we normally calculate the social cost of carbon, the way we always do this in environmental, in any externality, we say, it, let's suppose we emit one extra ton of carbon dioxide today. What does that do to GDP over the next 100 years? All right. And that's how we get the marginal externality. Here, I'm doing something different. I'm saying I want to get the total benefit from a large truncation divided by the total emission reduction, not one ton of carbon dioxide reduction but total amount. I did this for every respondent in the survey individually and for groups of respondents, all everybody, economists, climate scientists, people in North America, people in Europe, and so on. Now, the details are in a paper that was published a couple of years ago, uh, The Social Cost of Carbon Revisited, but I just want to show you a couple of uh, diagrams, a couple of graphs. So uh, these are some results, and uh, I'll explain what we get from this, what we learn from this. First, look at economists versus climate scientists. Economists on the left top, climate scientists on the right. The mean social cost of carbon for economists, $173 a ton. Climate scientists, three hundred over $300. Climate scientists, much more pessimistic than economists. North America versus Europe, no difference. Almost identical average values for the social cost of carbon. But look at something else. Look at the dispersion of these numbers. They're all over the place. In fact, let's put everybody together. Take everybody and look at their social cost of carbon values. Do a histogram. The histogram run, runs from zero to $1,000. The mean is $290, but the dispersion is huge, huge. Many people are under $100, they're up here. Many people are between $100 and $400. Many are above $400. The range, the dispersion is enormous. Here is the cumulative distribution function. What we did is I fitted these numbers to uh, three different three different distributions a gamma thin tailed gamma distribution a generalized extreme value type 2 frechet distribution that's fat tailed and a log normal distribution which is kind of right in the middle between fat and thin tailed didn't really matter which distribution i used you get this huge dispersion huge dispersion huge disagreement so what do we learn from this exercise? Surveying experts. First, the estimates are much higher than are used in United States policy analysis, or as far as I can tell, European policy analysis today. There's variation across groups and dispersion within groups, but these numbers are consistent with the social cost of carbon well above $200 a ton. All right. And there's also dispersion across beliefs and probabilities of extreme impacts. And that's the key driver. 
Now, maybe this tells us that there's so much disagreement that we can't rely on expert opinion because the experts don't agree. Well, that's, that's something. We might argue that the set of experts is too broad. I mean, just because they published highly cited articles, so what? Maybe there are too many of them. One of the questions I asked in the survey uh, was, how confident are you in the numbers you're giving me? Very confident, sort of confident, not confident. And so I trimmed the sample. I got rid, of, I, I only kept the very confident responses and that reduced the numbers for the social cost of carbon. It lowered it to around $80 a ton. Now, is the correct number $80 or $200? Well, you know, it depends on how you view expertise. So are you very democratic? And, you know, even if you're not so confident, I take your, I take your, your, uh, uh, your estimate seriously. Or do you view only the ones that are, should we only count the ones that are very confident? We're still getting numbers that are larger, much larger uh, than what uh, the US government was working with, okay? There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty. There's uncertainty because as I told you, we don't know climate sensitivity. We don't know the damage function. We don't know the discount rate. There's so much we don't know, that's it. That means there's uncertainty. And there's uncertainty because when I surveyed these people, these experts, they're all over the place, all over the place. So we can conclude that there is a great, great deal of uncertainty over the social cost of carbon. What does this mean? One argument is what, what some people would say is let's just wait, don't do anything. Don't spend money now, just wait, wait 10 years, wait 20 years until we learn more. But that's not what this means. In fact, it means just the opposite. It means that we need to buy insurance because even though we don't know what will happen, there's a possibility of something very bad happening. You don't know whether there will be a flood, your home will be flooded or whether it'll burn down, but you have insurance. If you own a home, you have insurance. Most people do because you worry about the chance of a really bad event happening. And you can think of a carbon tax as insurance. How big a tax? We have to worry about that. I can tell you what I think, but we don't, there's a lack of agreement about this. Now, before we get to how big a tax, I got to tell you that we got another complication. I said we have to focus on a possible catastrophic outcome. But once we're in the world of catastrophes, once we start thinking about catastrophes, is climate the only one we should think about? Shouldn't we think about other potential catastrophes that could even be more likely or as likely and could occur sooner? How about a pandemic? Something worse, as bad as or worse than the Spanish flu. By the way, the CDC in the United States says, you think COVID is bad? Just wait. More, worse things are coming. Just wait. Worse pandemics are going to appear. We're going to have worse things happening. So that's something to worry about. I'm going to depress you. Sergio is going to arrange for antidepressants to be sent to all of you who are watching this, listening to this talk. So pandemics, nuclear terrorism, bioterrorism. It's a group at Harvard at the Kennedy School that studies nuclear terrorism that argues that the likelihood of a nuclear device being set off by terrorists in a major city in the next 10 years, the probability is at least 50%. That's pretty frightening. Extreme earthquakes or volcanic eruptions and on and on. So can we treat them one by one? You know, look at them individually and get a benefit cost ratio for each one. And I've shown with Ian Martin, who I work with at LSC, 
that you really can't treat these independently. That because these are big things, they're not marginal, conventional cost-benefit analysis breaks down. And it may not be optimal to avert a catastrophe, even if the benefit of doing so exceeds the cost. And this is work that we've done uh, that appeared in the uh, American Economic Review some years ago, more recently in a paper on pandemics versus macroeconomic risk that just appeared in the Economic Journal. Conclusions. There's a lot we don't know about climate change, climate sensitivity, impact of warming, discount rate. And it's not good to make believe that we know more than we really do. You know, it's, it's nice to think we know, we know more, but that's a mistake. Mervyn King, who ran as the governor of the Bank of England for a long time, uh, wrote a book when he stepped down from that position. The book, it's a wonderful book. I recommend it called The End of Alchemy. It's about monetary policy uh, and banking. But he said in that book, uh, he calls this deep uncertainty. The fundamental point about radical uncertainty, things we really don't know about, is that if we don't know what the future might hold, we don't know. And there's no point pretending otherwise. So. We shouldn't make believe that we know more than we do. And unfortunately, we often do make believe that we know more than do. The models make believe, and uh, political and economic commentators make believe. We shouldn't do that. The other point is that what matters for the social cost of carbon is the possibility of a catastrophic outcome. We can't really use these models to look at catastrophic outcomes. All we can really do is consider plausible outcomes and probabilities. Maybe use expert elicitation. There's a lot of uncertainty. And given uncertainty, should we wait? No, the insurance value of acting now is large. And we have to focus on the uncertainty. And what we need to do as economists is try to evaluate the insurance value of early action. That's your homework for the, for tonight. We, we got to figure out what is the value of that insurance because that's what essentially we're buying with a carbon tax. All right, uh, let me stop here because I want to allow time for questions, discussion, disagreement, and whatever. Hey, Robert, thank you very much for your uh, very good presentation. It's a very interesting presentation. So I collect uh, uh, some questions. Uh, okay, Professor Rosa, maybe, um, maybe I leave the floor to, Rob uh, to Roberto and after I, I ask you this question, I prefer to leave the floor to Roberto. Thank you. Professor Pindak, uh, thank you very much for this uh, talk, uh, which summarizes uh, a lot of uh, extremely relevant issues. Um, I, I'd like to add a comment, uh, which is about uh, uh, intrinsic weaknesses of integrated assessment models, at least uh, those uh, rice like, so to say, okay, and uh, about the concept of uh, uh, damage function. Uh, I am really astonished to see uh, that the impact on the economy can be uh, just uh, 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 stated as formulated. As a, as a function that simply melts away a part of, <laughs> of a potential GDP. In fact, uh, in my understanding for, for the research I did, uh, the, um, there are many different uh, channels of transmission of climate change. You can imagine there is an impact on agricultural productivity, there is an impact related to sea level rise, to human health, to labor productivity. There are many, there are many. And each of them has a different causal mechanism, hits different sectors and so on. And uh, without building models with a decent level of detail, which distinguish among the different impacts of climate change, and not simply say temperature, okay, melting away the GDP, there is very little progress we can make. And this is, seems to me extremely important in addition to all the points you raised also in another uh, sense, because uh, what I feel what from the research I did is that climate change will have 
uh, dramatic distributional consequences uh, among people, among in industry sectors, among uh, regions, countries, de developed versus developing countries, and so on. So we need detail. Um, perhaps we, I don't know how much we can help in the defining social cost of carbon, yes. But nonetheless, in order to manage the not only economic, but also political dimension of climate change, we definitely need models that are not too aggregated to, uh, to, to, to draw uh, policy recommendation. I don't know if you agree uh, with this. No? Thank you. So I, what can I say? I agree with you. In fact, <laughs> I'm working, I'm finishing a book on climate change and I should quote you because um, <laughs> if this is recorded, what you just said, I should just put it in my book with quotes. Let me just raise one issue, though, and, and you know I agree. We need to look at details. There are distributional problems. There's many aspects of damages, but there's a fundamental uncertainty. And, and let me just look at sea levels as an example. So you might ask, you know, what do we think might happen to sea levels over the next hundred years? You know, are the glaciers going to melt? Is our sea levels going to rise a little bit? Are they going to rise a lot? even if we knew how much the temperature was going to increase. And we don't know that, but suppose we did. So if we say, okay, what happens if the temperature goes up by one degree, by two degrees, by four degrees, by five degrees? There are many models that look at that and they're all over the place. So if you ask the people that study this, these are climate scientists or people who study sea level rise, you ask them, look, Everybody agrees the temperature is going to go up by three degrees. Okay, we're sure of that. We know that. What's going to happen to the sea level? You're going to get answers that are all over. The huge range. Very little. Somewhat. A meter. Two meters. Three meters. Your numbers are all over the place. And that's the problem. There's so little we know. So it's not just we don't know what the temperature will do. We don't, but we don't know what many things will do. We don't know what sea levels what will happen to sea levels? So uh, that's the difficulty we're in. Yes, we need to look at the details, but even with the details, there's huge uncertainty. That's the problem. Uh, okay, so if I, I, now I try to uh, summarize a couple of questions after I leave the floor uh, to another of our colleagues. Uh, so, uh, Robert, I, I understand it's, uh, I, I, I've written some important points. So the discount rate is a problem. So, in the integrated assessment model, another is damage function, another is uh, uncertainty, so, and especially about uh, catastrophic events. Okay, so this. Uh, uh, so, my uh, one, one problem that I have in mind is uh, is, uh, is there is not a possibility to combine. So it's, it's totally useless this methodology. Also, there is a possibility to combine uh, this. I understand that also when uh, last uh, things that uh, Roberto said. So that we need a lot of details. I understand there is a huge, but the problem is so big uh, that we have to try to uh, figure out uh, a, a, I don't know a methodology together in order to solve this. Uh, because I think also other methodologies have uh, some faults. Faults, I think, but is a. Uh, uh, maybe there is a manner to combine. I don't know, but because I say, yes, I'm a little researcher. But uh, um, uh, I, I, I give you a couple of questions. Okay, so after I deliver for uh, this is a, uh, does the risk of a catastrophe imply that we should use a very low discount rate, even negative? Is a question. Another is uh, you have said that so many times we don't know. No uncertainty. We don't know a lot of things. Uh, such an issue is often approached uh, through the so-called uncertainty models uh, that usually adopt a minimax approach. Do you think uh, that this approach can be useful? And last, uh, after I leave you to answer, you say that uh, uh, a solution is to buy insurance. So you also, uh, our homework, if, if I said, how can an insurance company compute the fair premium if there is a, such an uncertainty on the, the outcome is also a, a, another big issue, I think. Last point is my question. Uh, catastrophic events, we are not able to calculate because uh, now you, you said that is uh, on uh, Cold War and so on. So the idea of uh, uh, the period in uh, 1961 and uh, you know, related to the uh, nuclear weapon uh, danger. 
but also uh, COVID-19 is a catastrophic event. And maybe we have, uh, unfortunately, we are uh, an experimental, uh, you know, a realistic experiment that we could help us to calculate something. But I, you know, I stop now. After we have other, uh, at the moment, two questions, we combine. So I, I'll be forward to Simone Borghi at a certain point. After we summarize the question of uh, uh, Christian Gollier. But, uh, so let me, I'll res let me respond to, to, the, to the questions you raised. Uh, the first question you raised is whether the risk of a catastrophe should mean that we have a low discount rate. And that's actually a very interesting point. I wish Christian were here because he could say a lot about that. So if you think about the Ramsey model and the Ramsey equation for the discount rate, and you add in uncertainty, that lowers the discount rate, okay? And in fact, if you go back to um, even the Marty Weitzman's paper on uh, why the future should be discounted as a lower at a lower rate when there's uncertainty, because the discount because of Jensen's inequality and the discount factor when there's uncertainty, there's indeed an argument for a lower discount rate when there's a risk of catastrophe. And in fact, you can take you you can create a version of the Ramsey equation where there's a catastrophe that occurs, it's a Poisson arrival, and that will give you a lower discount rate, all right? Um, so that's a very good point. Um, it doesn't mean the discount rate should be only 1%. That's not clear. But whatever you think that discount rate is, let's say you think it's 3% or 4%, it might be that you should lower it at least somewhat because of that risk. So that's a very good point. And that needs to be studied, by the way, because there, you know, we know that that's the case, but we haven't done much on uh, what does that mean for the discount rate. Christian actually, Christian Gaudier has worked on this. Maybe you can bring him back from whatever meeting he's in. And then you asked about, uh, uh, someone asked about Minimax and whether we should look at, um, given all the uncertainty, absolutely. Um, in this world of deep uncertainty, um, minimax rules can make sense. And in, you know, in we the work in decision theory tells us that we can, there are very good arguments for using minimax approaches to decision making when you have uncertainty of this kind. Absolutely. You worry about the, and it's connected to insurance because what a minimax rule does is it kind of leads you to avoid the worst possible outcome. And then insurance, how do you compute the premium? You know, insurance companies worry about this. And what do they do? They get, they go to get reinsurance. So um, Swiss Re, for example, is a reinsurance company that insures the insurance companies. They, the reinsurance companies, have teams of PhDs working on how do you figure out the premium? Because this is exactly what they're concerned about. They're insuring the insurance companies. They worry about a catastrophic outcome. What will happen to them? So the answer is we don't know how to compute the premium. I mean, I gave it as a homework assignment, but this is exactly what the reinsurance companies are doing and working on. And, um, you know, I was at a conference in Paris. Christian was there, I believe, uh, that was sponsored by one of the, uh, the French reinsurance companies where this issue was discussed and maybe that would be a nice next step get some of the people who are working on this to talk and to present some of their work so i, I hope that addresses the questions that you raised okay perfect now uh now i leave the floor to uh simone borghese actually uh you gave us a fascinating and depressing speech <laughs> fascinating because you are always fascinating in your presentation depressing because it's clear that we have uh, interdependent catastrophes and we feel like that wave is coming on us now i was uh, interested in your um, expert elicitation in the comparison between economist and climate scientist since you are talking to an audience of environmental economists, I was wondering what was the share of environmental economists in that group? 
of experts, if you if you recall it, and whether you know we are in between somehow uh, the two the two disciplines, and whether this may affect uh, the results that you found. So I can tell you what I suspect. I'm not sure, but here's what I suspect. First of all, the economists were all working on climate problems, climate economics in some way. So what I did, the way I found people is using keywords in their work and keywords like climate, climate impact, things like that. So they were all environmental economists who had done work in climate, okay? All of the economists and climate scientists, of course, that all, were all working in climate. So the expertise was climate economics and climate science. Now, um, why did the climate scientists tend to have higher probabilities of catastrophic outcomes than the economists. One possibility, this is I think what's going on, is that um, they don't fully understand what we mean by GDP. And so it could be that for them, um, the notion of a 30% drop or 40% drop in GDP, you know, oh sure, that could happen. Whereas economists think, well, that's worse than the Great Depression. So that could be what's going on. But you know, I don't really know because I never did a follow-up. Um, it would have been very interesting to do a follow-up or actually talk to these people, but I didn't do that, unfortunately. So I don't know for sure why we have that difference. Something to, well, let's say it's a homework for all of us. I'd like somebody else to run the uh, survey that I did you know, do it differently. And, and I think that's a useful way to explore this problem. Look at plausible outcomes, plausible probabilities, plausible discount rates, and what do you get? What does it show? Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Simone. Simone Borghesi from um, University of Siena, European University Institute. And uh, uh, there is a question that uh, is from uh, uh, Christian Golin. Now I leave the floor to Ilenia that I can, uh, um, I can read the question of uh, uh, Golin. Okay. Thank you, Sergio. Um, so, Professor Golier has uh, written two questions, so I'm going to read them now. So um, he said that he agrees uh, that uh, there is uncertainty about the flow of damages. Uh, he asks, uh, is this uncertainty bigger than, say, the flow of net benefits of Amazon in 100 years from now? And uh, the second part is, uh, do you recommend moving to a cost efficiency approach? Let politicians choose the carbon budgets and let economists derive the, sh derive the shadow price of carbon associated to this constraint. Hmm. Let me <coughs> let me turn to the uh, to that first. I'm not quite sure how po politicians are going to ask. Well, how do we get the carbon budget? Where, where do we help us? Where does it come from? And so, I mean, we would know how to get a shadow price. To get a shadow price, you need to know damages. I don't know how you get a shadow price otherwise. But I don't know what you're going to tell the politicians when they ask you. How do we get the carbon budget? Where, where does this come from? So I, I don't quite see how that would work, but maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something that, that Christian has in mind. As far as the first question about the uncertainty, you know, over damages and so on, how does it compare to the uncertainty about Amazon over the next 100 years? I assume he's talking about Amazon Corporation, the company, and what's they're going to look like in 100 years. You know, here's the problem. How many of you who are watching this think that in 100 years from now, we're not going to be here, of course, but uh, will there be um, a United States the way we know it? Will there be an Italy and a France and Germany the way we now know it? Will the world look the way, the, how will the world look compared to the way the world looks today? Um, what will technology look like? What will um, health look like? Will we have blown ourselves up? Will there have been a nuclear exchange by then? 
I mean, there is so much uncertainty about the way the world's going to look in a hundred years. And, you know, I'm always amazed. I see some of these models, they run them out 200 years or 300 years. Will humans be around in 300 years? I mean, it's just, we're in a, it, there's so much uh, uncertainty about what the world's going to look like in a hundred years that, I don't know, I don't even know how we can address these questions, but maybe I'm pessimistic. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And, okay, and then um, there's uh, uh, two more questions uh, which I've just summarized for you. Um, and these are um, skepticism about the human responsibility on climate change could prevent us from adoptive preventing policies uh, about climate change. See, for example, the Trump administration. Is the CC community ready to react to possible skepticism in the public opinion about our capacity to reduce uh, CO2 concentrations with measures like carbon tax? And what's your opinion about this? So look, um, you know, the problem, here's the problem with carbon tax. It's the word tax. So uh, <laughs> you may not know this, but people don't like the word tax. It's a horrible word. Politicians really don't like it. You know, it's quite amazing that um, right now in the United States and the Biden administration, there's a plan to be, move very aggressively on climate change, very aggressively. All kinds of things are under consideration, not a carbon tax. It's amazing to me that with all of the things, you know, have, have uh, electric cars, charging stations, pay for charging stations everywhere, um, you know, do pay for subsidized solar, everything, all of the stuff that's being considered, no consideration of a carbon tax, the most simple, most direct way to reduce emissions. So we have a problem. A, yes, there's a lot of skepticism, and that means that politically it's difficult. But even people who think that climate is real, climate change is real, and we have to do something, don't want a carbon tax. You know, the Green New Deal in the United States, the proposed radical approach to climate change, no carbon tax. I find that absolutely amazing. But you see, I'm an economist. So for an economist, Obviously, a tax is the simplest way, the most direct way to do something. No, people are afraid of a tax. They don't want to deal with a tax. So uh, I'm actually very pessimistic that I'm very pessimistic that we're going to keep the temperature from rising above two degrees. I'm very pessimistic that we're going to do enough because even Europe and the United States, which is doing the most to, and plans to do the most to reduce emissions compared to China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, Brazil, even the United States and Europe is, is doesn't, a carbon tax is just uh, too unpopular. So I'm, it's unfortunate, but this is where we are. Okay, thank you very much. But maybe using the uh, no the double dividend could be a manner in order to you know to give us some uh, hope for uh, the future. No, to also to impose uh, um, the the carbon tax. I understand totally. So the, the tax is a problem in general. Is uh, the name is a problem also because uh, some of our colleagues I totally agree. We are speaking about uh, carbon price. No, is uh, could be also a manner in order to. To, be, to speak better about uh, 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 economical problems. So we are speaking not about uh, a tax, but a, a price. And maybe the only manner is to combine subsidies and, uh, and taxes or not. Yeah, I mean, we could try to do that. And, um, you, you know, one way to deal with the carbon tax is to say, is to say, look, we're going to give it back to you. We're going to use it in the United States, for example. We're going to reduce the payroll tax, which is a regressive tax. Uh, in Europe, we're going to reduce the VAT, for example, the value-added tax. We're going to give it back. It doesn't matter. People say, yeah, let's reduce the VAT. Reduce the, re if we get, let's reduce the payroll tax. But don't impose a carbon tax. 
it's strange. It's amazing. Uh, it's it's unfortunate. Maybe there's a way to do it. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it isn't looking good right now. But I, I'm searching up. No, no. I, OK, I understand totally. But do, uh, do you think of it is a last question because I, uh, we, uh, we use all of your time and so I, and those, also I remember also that uh, tomorrow we will meet again. Uh, but the last question is this one. Do you think that uh, this new period, so uh, COVID-19 uh, hit uh, the world and, uh, and behind this, uh, there is also something that is a, 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 a unsustainable growth in some manner, no? We understand also that there are some elements that are environment that uh, you have to pay attention in order to touch some things about the world. If you touch this, uh, you can also hit uh, economical point. You know, the, the uh, GDP, um, reduction this year is uh, for Italy is more or less uh, 10 percent this year so we are speaking about uh, exactly a catastrophe according to uh, your definition of 10 20 percent we are more or less in this direction uh, and also in the same time there is uh, a change in the uh, from the politicians uh, now with the uh, uh, European Green Deal so in, a, in, in it, European Green Deal started before COVID-19 now is the uh, next generation EU uh, part of this is also devoted to uh, subsidizing uh, uh, energy transition. So this is in the middle. Maybe this could be an op. So uh, uh, all people is uh, uh, we 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 are understanding that we have to do something. Now I understand that uh, we, are, we can do pessimistic because everybody is selfish. Now the point behind it, but maybe with uh, political situation also the historical situation is exactly in, you know, hit by hit by uh, COVID-19 could uh, have a change in this or not well I mean I, I first of all the COVID-19 catastrophe is not as bad as what might be a climate catastrophe because yeah Italy's GDP dropped 10 percent much of Europe had a 10 percent impact uh, from COVID but there's now a recovery happening and Europe is actually projected to have pretty high GDP growth in the coming year or two, and likewise in the United States. So the drop in GDP that occurred because of COVID, fortunately, is, is more or less temporary. I mean, it's over a year, two years, not over 20 years or 10 years even. Um, but look, in terms of what will we do, we will do things. There are plans to do things, to take action regarding climate change. All sorts of things that we will do. My own view is that we're gonna do some of these things. There are a couple of problems. The one is the we. The we that's gonna do the most is Europe and the United States and maybe Japan and Canada. Not enough. The we is not enough. That, that doesn't include enough countries. And my second concern, and this may just reflect my pessimism, you know, I write about catastrophes. Not many people focus on that. Um, so it may just reflect my pessimism, but even with the we doing all that we are going to do, I don't think it's going to be enough. And I think, you know, if I had to make a bet, we don't know what's going to happen to temperature. We don't know what's going to happen to the impact. But if I had to make a bet, um, I would bet that we're not going to be able to achieve the limit on temperature increases that people think is necessary you know the, the one and a half or two degree increase in temperature that people think is critical i don't think we're going to be able to keep to that um but again that could just reflect my pessimism okay okay thank you very much uh robert so uh i remember we will see tomorrow so i thank you also for tomorrow <laughs> uh, tomorrow we will have uh, this second uh, meeting that is, uh, will be a, a meeting uh, with uh, firms so uh, uh, our uh, minister of uh, sustainable infrastructure which is uh, um, professor uh, enrico giovannini uh, uh, professor pindaik and professor rick van der Plug. And the three firms, so we, have, we will have a CEO of uh, A2A, that is uh, um, uh, our uh, uh, company of energy um, and water, water energy. And so, um, so we are also a Feralpi group uh, with uh, uh, the uh, president of Feralpi group and also Aqua Bresciane. Uh, so we will see uh, tomorrow and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed this. Thank you, Sergio. And thanks to thank everybody you, who spent the time listening.
Bye-bye. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you. See you tomorrow.